Hi, everyone, and welcome to People Potential with Amanda. Thank you for listening in today. I'm your host, Amanda Flacing, and I'll be bringing on various experts to discuss empowering individuals and organizations to achieve their full potential. Hello, and welcome to People Potential with Amanda. Today, I am so privileged to have a new friend of mine, Brian Collins, on with me. We actually met on Clubhouse, and I had the pleasure and privilege of chatting with him, getting to know him a little bit better, and he's so supportive and offered to um, help me out in any way. Um, How many people do that, I don't know. So I just want to take the time to introduce him before, uh, before we get chatting. So... Brian is a former Disney Imagineer, now a global innovation consultant and founder of the Brainstorm Institute. He's a speaker, he's an educator, a relationship builder, and an officer of the U.S. Air Force Auxiliary. So let me dive into that and unpack that a little bit before we get started. So as a former Walt Disney Imagineer, he helped create the magic for virtually all of Disney's Florida theme parks writing scripts for some of the world's most beloved attractions. At other times in his career, he produced work for a who's who list of corporations, as well as small entrepreneurial ventures. He's a passionate educator and has served as the faculty as a professor of several schools, including the University of Central Florida. And I know he was recently lecturing at our very own McGill University in Montreal. So. He also has a love and deep understanding of new and emerging technologies. I mean, what does he not do? So (laughs) he loves to look into how they apply to business and helps, and that has really helped fuel his career. So now he's a sought after innovation consultant through the practice that I mentioned called the Brainstorm Institute, where he combines creative and design thinking skills with the strategic business acumen. So beyond the Brainstorm Institute, he's also a senior director, innovations and strategic in- initiatives at Magic Bytes, a producer of world-class multimedia and gaming content. He is also an accomplished speaker. In addition to being requested to speak on numerous podcasts like this one, he's also available to deliver keynote addresses, lectures, and workshops, or other corporate or conference presentations. And just to bit, give a bit of background, he's also um, a really well-versed scholar. He has a master's degree in marketing from Webster University, where he was a distinguished graduate and have, has a bachelor's degree in advertising from Texas Tech University. So he has uh, done so much in his life. And on top of all of that, he's also a captain and deputy commander in the United States Air Force Auxiliary and has done all kinds of volunteering, is active in his synagogue, and is on several boards of directors. So Brian, thank you so much for joining me today. What a privilege. Can't wait to meet that guy. He sounds like amazing. He is, and he's you. (laughs) (laughs) So Brian, Um, tell us a little bit more about what you do. Um, Let's start with the Walt Disney Imagineering, a a little bit of background, and then I'd love to hear more about what you're doing now at the Brainstorm Institute. Yeah, so so my career is really, I kind of consider it being built on like three pillars of my past experience. And uh, the first of those pillars is innovation and creativity um, that goes all the way back to, to my days as a Walt Disney Imagineer. And, um, you know, when, when I was working for Disney, uh, my job for them was as a show writer. And when you talk about show writing for Disney, you're not, not talking about really kind of like writing shows, traditional shows, like stage shows that you would think of, but you're writing for the Disney show as a whole. And so what that meant is that I got to write bad jokes for like the Jungle Cruise and the Great Movie Ride and and, uh, Epcot and um, all the theme parks and and plaques and things like that. So it was was an amazing uh, experience. And what do you do now uh, at the Brainstorm Institute? I, knew, I know yeah. that you're doing a lot more because I, I heard you're lecturing at McGill and I know you lecture yeah. other places, but, but let's dive into the Brainstorm Institute. How yeah. did that start and, yeah. and what are you working on now? So, so to tell a little bit about um, what I'm doing now and kind of how, how all that past experiences 
kind of come together. Um, so that first pillar that I build my career on is, um, like I said, the innovation and creativity. Um, as you say, I also have a, a really strong passion for education, and that's a second um, really strong passion of mine is looking at how we can push education in new ways and exciting ways and um, create content that's really engaging for the learners out there. And I've got a couple really kind of interesting, fun initiatives I'm working on for that. And then the third pillar is working with new and emerging technologies. So like augmented reality, virtual reality, um, new web platforms, um, all that kind of stuff and seeing how we can take that and cross pollinate that in new and exciting ways. So um, it, it keeps me uh, keeps me off the streets at night, a little bit busy. But I it's love fun. that. It's I know you're so extremely fun. busy, so I don't know how you find the time to do it all. But uh, let's dive into how do you guide people towards their creative potential or their creativity potential? Does everyone yeah. have that within them or, and how do you, and if so, like, how do you, how do you develop it? They do. I mean, everybody, I believe, you know, is creative. Um, I mean, every, everyone's, you know, got the ability to, to be creative. And um, I, when, when I talk to a lot of either lecturer to, to students or, or to clients, one of the things that I talk about quite a bit is um, something that I call our, uh, well, I call the WDI DNA, uh, WDI for Walt Disney Imagineering. So um, I believe everybody has like five components of their WDI DNA that, that make them up. Um, and it's passion, intuition, inclusiveness, curiosity, and emotion. And you know, I mean, these are things that just come very, very naturally to us um, as, as, you know, really just as human beings. Um, it, it's just how we manifest that creativity. So, yeah, I mean, everybody um, has got that spark inside of them. Um, some people maybe need a little bit of coaching to kind of help uh, bring it out a little bit more or apply it to, to whatever they're doing. But um, anyone can be creative. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a huge believer in that as well. Sometimes we do need that coaching um, to we, we get like deep into the quantitative side or the tactical side. And we, you know, don't take the initiative maybe to take a step back and see like, how can I bring my creative side into this? And um, diving into that, let's go into yeah. or digging into that. What's what is design thinking? What What is that all about? And then uh, what are three or five tips towards achieving that methodology for someone that's a beginner? Let's say I've never done any design well, thinking. So first, let's start with what what is it? Design thinking to me, you know, I mean, that's kind of like um, a, a concept that's really kind of been around for a very, very long time. And it's gone by different names. Um, you know, design thinking, I, I think, is kind of like a, a term that a lot of people um, hear these days and are familiar with. Um, but um, really, it, it has to do with how you apply that creativity and that innovation um, to your workplace in order to get maximum results um, on, on the creative level. And there are, I think, a lot of different things that people can do to kind of help facilitate that. Um, I, I mean, I, I think the first, uh, one of the first and most important things that people need to do um, when they start thinking about uh, design thinking is, is first they need to understand what makes them tick inside. You know, what makes me tick as a person creatively and, and innovatively? Um, and also what makes other people tick as well, what makes other people creative and, and understanding that. Um, I, it was interesting. I was actually speaking about McGill. I was just doing a, um, a, a workshop for um, their continuing education department, speaking to people who are already out in the workforce. And one of the things that I spoke to them about was 
the importance of understanding different communication styles mm -hmm. and to kind of apply that more towards your audience, which I, I think tends to be more in like the HR and business executive side. Um, you know, sometimes that's understanding what your communication style is like and maybe also what the other person sitting across that desk from you, what their communication style is like. There are some people where if you ask them, how's your day going? Um, they'll just say, fine. And then they'll just kind of sit there and, you know, nothing will really kind of come of it. And uh, you'll be like trying to have a conversation, almost like pulling teeth. And then there are other people where if you ask them, how's your day, people like me, I'm not going to tell you just how my day is. I'm going to tell you how my week has been. I'm going to ask you how your week has been. You're going to find out how my dog's week has been. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to keep talking and talking and talking. And, you know, when, when you have those two uh, opposing kind of communication styles in the same room, sometimes it can be really kind of interesting and, and, and maybe even a little bit weird because, you know, the one person who just kind of processes information in, in I would say, maybe a very linear, um, formal kind of a way that gives you those real short answers is like, when's that person going to just shut up and just tell me how his day was? And the other person, you know, is wondering, well, how come you're being so abrupt with me and why aren't you talking with me? And it isn't because they don't like each other or, or anything like that. It's just different communication styles. So, again, you know, to kind of bring it back to your audience, if, if you're interviewing a candidate um, and, you know, understanding these different communication styles, if you ask them a question and, you know, sometimes you might have to pull the answer out from them a little bit more, or sometimes they may give you way more than you want. Absolutely. So, so I think that's one one thing I, I would definitely offer up as a tip is, is understand and learn what those different communication styles are that people have and, and learn how to kind of adapt to them. Um, Actually, Brian, what yeah. I, I didn't tell you, what we do at SuccessFinder is a psychometric assessment. Oh, so yeah. the candidates that I interview, I'll usually ask them to do the assessment before so I can really have a look at their behavioral styles. And within there, I'll, I'll see how they yeah. communicate. So I can see actually exactly to your point, people are so different and some will have a high level of self-expression, will have a high level of self-understanding and really be able to chat and they'll go on and on and I'll have to maybe cut them a bit short. And some of them will have like high linguistic skills so they have no problem expressing themselves. Someone who maybe has more constraint is not as self-aware, self-understanding, or not as expressive, you'll have to exactly like pull those answers out of them and really ask more detailed questions to, to get to the information you want. Whereas those first, that first group, they'll just give you the information you want uh, without you barely having to ask anything. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's just so important to understand how that works, for sure. Um, very, very similar also to, you know, a lot, a lot of us have done um, like a DISC profile or Myers-Briggs or something like that. And um, that's kind of getting to what you were saying, different personality types. So all of that kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. And how we differentiate at, at SuccessFinder is we're not doing type style. Uh, yeah. We're looking at really behavioral styles and a lot yeah. more in-depth and, and higher resolution uh, type of assessments. So we're looking at a lot more traits versus uh, categorizing people in right. in types and people can uh, look listen to our my first podcast episode with my colleague Carolyn who is a product expert at SuccessFinder and we'll go into the different types of uh, of assessments and how to select one uh, that will be the most rigorous and and up to your uh, up to what you need at uh, for your use perfect wow um Fantastic. Um, let me also, um, you know, talk a little bit, kind of going hand in hand with that. Um, if I had to give maybe a second little tip, one thing I would think about is, um, you know, when, when it comes to design thinking, a big part of that is creating the right atmosphere so that people are comfortable in the environment mm -hmm. that they're working in. Um, they have the tools in, in the um just the ambiance, if you will, 
uh, that helps them kind of work best. And again, we're all very, very different. You know, some of us tend to be more tactile. Some of us are more verbal. Some are more audio. And some certainly are a lot more visual. So kind of allowing people to, to kind of um, work in an atmosphere that's very comfortable to them. And, uh, you know, if I were to kind of like bring my, put my imagineering hat on, one thing I would say is that there are like so many different ways, for example, that when you go to a Disney theme park that we tell our stories, so many tools that we use, we use um, all those things that, that tap into the different senses, the audio, you know, the music you might hear in the theme parks or the sound effects, the um, smells and scents when you walk by the bakery and you smell those delicious chocolate chip cookies mm -hmm. or you're inside an attraction and you're flying over um, an orange grove and you smell the oranges or, um, you know, sometimes the, um, uh, the lighting uh, design is very, very important to set the mood. And you can take all of those Imagineering uh, techniques that we use and transfer them to the workplace. There's no reason why you can't. And it doesn't really cost a, a lot of money to do that. But, you know, think about how maybe you could create an environment. Um, again, if, if you've got maybe a specific conference room where you bring people in or in your office, you know, that you like to interview your, your um, candidates or something like that, um, make it warm and welcoming for them, you know, maybe add some color, uh, you know, by using color splashes of lights or buy a, um, like a plug-in, you know, to give off different scents, you know, cinnamon or vanilla or something like that. Um, you know, certainly the music that you play or audio that you play can, can play into that. So, um, and, and if you're ever going to be doing uh, let's say a brainstorming session, you're, you're part of an internal team. Think about that as well, because that's a very, very important part of the design thinking process is creating that environment where people just feel, like I said, just comfortable to be able to express themselves in the way that, that they like to do that. Absolutely. I love it. As we um, hopefully return to our office uh, sooner than later, <laughs> we don't have a date just yet with what's going on in Montreal, but uh, we can definitely look into creating a warm, welcoming space for brainstorming that's conducive to brainstorming in there in one of our conference rooms and using some of those tips. Um, I know that our teams love the whiteboards, some of yeah. us more than others. <laughs> we just love drawing all over it. We've actually been lucky enough to have two design thinking sessions uh, during the last two months. So we're making it a monthly thing. And, and for now, it's been virtual. So we've done it on Zoom. We've used the breakout rooms and we've used, um, mm -hmm. I forget the name of the tool, but we're, we're able to, you know, collaborate on there on some kind of whiteboard. Um, do you have any other tips for design thinking done remotely? Well, you know, I, I think probably one of the biggest tips that I can give people for design thinking, whether it's in person or remotely, is make sure that you have an open mind. Um, there's, you know, one, one of the quotes, and, and that's something that one, one of the five parts of, of my WBI DNA is inclusiveness. And by inclusiveness, I mean being open to understanding different points of views, the way different people think. Um, there's a quote that I, that I always... Uh, use, which is your mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work unless it's open. And I, I think that's really true. You know, people have to understand that different people have different points of view. And, and um, especially when you have a challenge in front of you that you're trying to solve, or if, um, again, maybe coming back to, to um, an HR scenario, if, if you've asked a question and someone gets back to you with, an answer that maybe you didn't think about, um, you know, just be prepared to have that open mind and kind of take that in and, and see where it goes. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, just, just being inclusive of, of all kinds of different peoples and races and, and points of view and all that um, is, is so, so important. I love that. Thank you, Brian. We're definitely, uh, Diversity, and equity, and inclusion has been a huge topic for us uh, 
at SuccessFinder and in the HR space in general. So this is such a great tip of, you know, opening your mind, uh, being aware of unconscious bias, recognizing it and and having that open mindedness to to different types of opinions, different kinds of answers and uh, and more. So thank you so much. Uh, we've gotten so many great tips on how design thinking could be applied in the HR space. Uh, even from, you know, setting up your office for interviews properly, maybe like what in the remote environment, what background are you using, what visual cues, right. how uh, is the tone of your voice welcoming or not. Uh, There's so many elements that we could think of uh, and apply within the HR space. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I feel like we can go on and on forever, but let's keep this segment uh, short sure. for our listeners and um, everyone could check out Brian on LinkedIn at the brainstorminstitute.com as well. And uh, we'll link all his information in the show notes. Sure. Fantastic. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of People Potential with Amanda. I appreciate each and every listen and view. You can find the show notes on the SuccessFinder blog and be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our newsletter for all kinds of value-added content. Until next time, stay curious.